<laughs> All right, I think, yeah, we are officially on. Great. Awesome. So uh, we have with us Jerry Dworkin. Uh, Jerry is the CEO of Life Saving Resources. He's an aquatic expert. He focuses on training other water safety professionals and uh, ice rescue, and he's got a, a water safety academy. Um, he's been a EMS and firefighter for a, you know, I don't know, just a cup of coffee, you know, a little while. And uh, I met him through the National Drowning Prevention Alliance and some of the other water safety work we do. And, and Jerry is an all around fantastic dude. And I wanted to, to get him on because I know he's not only a great person, but super interesting and his story is really unique. And uh, and I don't know enough of it, honestly. So I was curious myself to hear kind of the, the, the origin story of, of Jerry and uh, you know where he came from and, and kind of the, the whole deal. So did I miss anything? Did I get it? Uh, pretty clear. That, that summed it up briefly. Yep. Um, awesome. And uh, so this is our second one, like I was telling you a minute ago. Um, so it's really exciting. This is our first time using this setup. So if I screw this up somehow, um, that's why. But uh, yeah, so right off the bat, um, it, why don't you go ahead and explain your, uh, literally your origin story. If you were a superhero and you had an origin story, um, how does yours begin and how does it go? Well, during uh, high school and college, I, I worked as a lifeguard and pool manager. Mm -hmm. And uh, while in college, I also became a volunteer firefighter. And uh, when I graduated college, I became an EMT. Okay. And uh, well, what made you want to first? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, between the lifeguarding and the firefighter and the uh, EMT, uh, it was a pretty good start to where I am today. And sure. When I uh, graduated college, my first job was with the American Red Cross, and I worked for them for 14 years. My okay. first first job was covering New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania as a field representative, training and supervising instructors, instructor trainers, and first aid and water safety and CPR. My second job, I uh, went to Westchester County, New York for seven years, and then Houston for five years, and then up to national headquarters for a year and a half. And then I decided I wanted to write my own curriculums and uh, do my own thing. So we started Life Saving Resources. What, what was also, that? Uh, that was in 1985, I believe. Okay. So up until then, you'd been doing just EMS and firefighter and? EMS, firefighter and, and Red Cross. And right. I was, uh, I maintained my EMT. I was also an EMT instructor in New York and Houston <laughs> and so forth. And when I went to, when we relocated to Virginia, I also became a career firefighter at that time with the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. And then in 97, I believe, we re moved, relocated to New Hampshire with the company. And I became a uh, firefighter for the Harrisville, New Hampshire Fire Department. Okay. And then we relocated to Kenny Bunkport seven years ago. And now I'm a uh, firefighter with Kenny Bunkport and uh, an EMT with the Kenny Bunkport EMS system. Is that still in the same state? Uh, I'm in Maine now. Maine, you move a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, one step <laughs> one step ahead of the law. Is that <laughs> so, but we're hoping uh, we're hoping George Bush will be back up here uh, in a couple of weeks. And we always enjoy seeing the Bush family around here. Does he live up there? Oh, yeah. yeah he nice. typically comes up here from mid-April until mid-October. And, uh, you know, as soon as uh, his wife passed away, he went into the hospital. And he keeps saying, I, I can't wait to get out and get back up to Kenny Bunkport. So we're hoping he makes it up here. That's fantastic. Um, so you started Life Saving Resources in 1980? 85. 85. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, not, to, not to date both of us here, but I was three years old then. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I was four. Yeah, very perfect. Exactly. You look at. Um, yeah. So you know, you started in 1985, and I mean, I imagine so you started it to write curriculum, right? Well, our our, our mission has always been to uh, mitigate drowning and aquatic injuries, and our, our company is dedicated to drowning and aquatic injury prevention and emergency management. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, we develop curriculums and conduct this training both nationally and internationally. And then I regularly consult as a forensics expert in drowning and aquatic injury cases. Okay. So what change has the company made from 1985 to now? Is it still the same basic premise or has it evolved? 
it it has evolved. We we started as a uh, also a distributor for rescue products and such training products, but uh, it was more of a distraction from what we wanted to do, which was focus on consulting and training and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've eliminated all products many years ago, and and we're able to focus exactly on what we intended to do, which was drown, uh, drowning prevention and. Uh, training programs and uh, consulting services. So now we uh, spend a lot of time training firefighters, law enforcement, EMS, and water rescue and ice rescue. We also do some lifeguard training and such. Uh, I've got speaking engagements all over the country and internationally and uh, uh, enjoy doing the work we're doing as a forensic expert in drowning and aquatic injury cases. So when someone hires you for a speaking engagement, what are they bringing you on to talk about? Well, for instance, uh, I've done a lot of work for the Club Managers Association of America. In fact, I'm heading down uh, our Train the Trainer Academy and Water Rescue is the 17th through the 20th. As soon as we finish on the 20th, I jump a flight to Atlanta and I'm speaking at the Georgia chapter of the Club Managers on the, the next day and basically talking about the prevention, the recognition, management of drowning and aquatic injuries. Gotcha. So that's general water safety info, not necessarily specific to ice water, right? Correct. Correct. So, 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 what is it? I mean, obviously, you don't want to give your whole talk here, but what is the kind of the sixty-second synopsis of what you tell people in those talks? Well, these people are all the club managers of the country clubs and so forth throughout okay. Georgia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my focus will be on the need to uh, basically hire qualified lifeguard personnel by screening them, checking their credentials and so forth, and then providing site-specific pre-service and in-service training, be sure they're qualified to work at their facilities. And then basically I advocate the need for them to conduct a threat assessment, determine the hazards and the risks that exist, remove or warn of the hazards, prohibit or safeguard the risks, determine the level of operational capability that's required of their personnel. And then basically in a nutshell, they need to train for, um, plan for and acquire the resources necessary to deal with the incidents that may occur. Got it. So you mentioned uh, before we got started that uh, hopefully you didn't get an actual fire call while we're on the call here. So and I was surprised that you're still an active EMS and firefighter. Uh, I am. I've been an EMT now for 45 years. Uh, my, That's amazing. My EMT was supposed to expire in March and right. I decided in October Mm -hmm. that I would renew it one more time. So between uh, October and uh, January, basically, I was able to accumulate all the CEH hours required to, to be a, recertified. That's impressive. So, but this is my last time as, a, as an EMT. How long so, I'll continue as a firefighter depends on how long I can crawl on the floor without passing out with their <laughs> pack on and to have 200 pounds worth of gear on my back. So how long will it last? How long does your certification last? Three years in, so in three the years. state of Maine. Yeah. Gotcha. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I'm uh, 68. Oh, wow. So you will be 71 when uh, it wraps up. Yeah. But that, that's fantastic. And the fact that you can still do it is amazing. You know, not that 68 is all that old, but, you know, I know guys that are younger than you who couldn't even begin to, uh, to do that. You know? Well, in, in uh, October, I decided, or November, I decided I'm going to try to fly down a set of stairs carrying six foot sheets of plexiglass. <laughs> oh, geez. And it, it didn't work. So that put nope. me out of commission for a couple months. But it did allow me to do a lot of my CEH online while I was laying in bed. So that, that helps. <laughs> so, um, I mean, if you're still actively working, uh, you said you, you actually were called for a fire recently, right? Uh, I had uh, two fire calls yesterday, one structure fire, and uh, I forgot what the second one was, but structure fire, and the uh, uh, day before Monday, I worked as uh, EMT for CHEMS, so uh, things get exciting every now and then. So, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what is your role on the truck if, for a fire or uh, an EMT situation? Uh, well, what is your job specifically? Well, as, as an EMT, it's to provide patient care and support the medic that's on board, uh, right. also to drive the ambulance. But as a firefighter, it, it depends. If, okay. Uh, I, I didn't know if you had a, a specialization. That no, you, uh, no. Yeah. We have, in Kenny Bunkport, we have four fire stations. And we have That's a variety right. of engines and brush trucks and boats and mm -hmm. ladder trucks and rescue trucks and such. So it all depends on the call. Uh, yesterday, as an example, the fire station's right across the street from my office. 
and we have a ladder truck there. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I'm an interior firefighter, if uh, there's a uh, non-interior firefighter who's qualified to drive the truck is showing up, I'd let them drive it so I can suit up and go into the fire. Gotcha. If there isn't a uh, driver showing up, then I'll take the truck and operate the truck until I can be relieved. Gotcha. So I know that your focus um, as a first responder and in general is on is on water safety. Are first responders in general trained in ice and water safety? They are not. Uh, okay. They cer certainly should be. And as an example, right. uh, in Maine, where we are, we have a strong water front coast line and so forth. Uh, it's our opinion that all firefighters in Maine should be trained at the water rescue awareness and the ice rescue awareness level. And that they need to, based on the threat assessment, determine the level of operational capability and have personnel trained at the technician level if they have a threat within their area. And that goes throughout the country. Obviously, Florida firefighters don't need to be trained in ice rescue, but they certainly need to be trained in water rescue. For sure. And, I mean, uh, I mean o oceans, pools, you know. Right. So yeah. it's our opinion that in water rescue that every firefighter should be trained at the water rescue awareness level. They need to be provided with some survival skills. And uh, again, if they have water, regardless of the venue within their jurisdiction, they, they need to have a team trained at the technician level as well. So if they're not providing specific training, um, you know, a, you know, EMT or fire crew, you know, now that comes to a, you know, a water safety emergency, what do they do? How do they even know to begin? Do they just wing well, it? I mean, well, exactly. That that's the expectation from the public that they're going to be able to put on their capes and do all their superhero things. Sure, yeah, like uh, they do for fires case. or all the other things that we. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I received a phone call from a fire chief yesterday. I won't say where, but he stated basically he's been doing this for thirty-two years. They've never had to put a firefighter in the water, uh, but he thinks it's time that they be trained awareness level. And that for those that were interested, perhaps to go on to the technician level. And I said, basically, you've just jinxed yourself because you just told me that in 32 years, you've never had to put anybody in the water. Uh, Guaranteed just, tomorrow you will. Yeah. Exactly. It's just a matter of time. And uh, again, if any department has any kind of water venue within their jurisdiction, whether it's a water park or a river, a lake, a stream, a, a hot tub, they should be trained at the awareness level. And if the technical expertise is required to put personnel in the water, they better get a person personnel trained and equipped at the technician level as well. And the, the money, is, you know, it's very expensive to do that. And as an example, uh, an ice rescue suit uh, costs uh, approximately a thousand dollars. So okay. if you're going to put, uh, you know, personnel in the water to be trained at the ice rescue technician level, you don't just need one suit. You need a backup okay. person as well. You need shore based personnel wearing protective gear as well. So it's very expensive. But again, the, there is a standard, and it's the NFPA 1670 standard for technical rescue that basically states, again, the authority have, having jurisdiction needs to do a threat assessment. You need to determine the level of operational capability required of their personnel and then plan for, train for, and acquire the resources necessary to deal with the incident. Now, uh, who, obviously, the so is that paid for out of the, the fire department's budget? Uh, there are federal grants that are available. Uh, okay. However, it's, it's very difficult to get those grants. Uh, a lot of the grants are being used for apparatus and and personnel uh, to staff stations and such. Mm -hmm. But uh, as an example, we just did some major training for the state of Vermont where several departments were able to get state grants uh, just for their personnel to be trained and equipped at the ice rescue and water rescue level. Nice. So you've mentioned, you know, the awareness level, the technician level. What are some of the other levels? Is that, is that where it ends? Or is uh, it it's, there there's three levels, the okay. awareness, the operations, and the technician. Basically, the awareness level is uh, basically just classroom and basic shore-based rescue skills and such. Whereas the technician level, it's the personnel that are putting on their suits and getting in the water to perform a rescue. Got it. And what do you think is kind of the, the, the best thing that, you know, people who learn these different levels get out of it? 
you know, obviously they learn water safety is their, you know, maybe broader applications for their everyday um, job as a EMT or a firefighter or. Well, it certainly makes their jobs a lot more interesting. We've sure. had, we've had people that have attended our training who have stated that it's, it's the best training they've ever had. But our philosophy is uh, unlike most training in the first responder area, where you spend a lot of time standing around with your hands in your pockets waiting for your turn. In our training programs, they are constantly uh, and intensively ongoing with their training. And as an example, we have our annual International Water Rescue Training Trainer Academy coming up this uh, a week from tomorrow. Okay. And it goes Thursday through Sunday. And just as example, how many how, how many years have you had that? Uh, this will be our thirteenth annual. Wow! And you've done it thirteen years in a row. Right, and, and we've actually we've actually done fourteen within the thirteen years. Okay, but we have firefighters coming from Washington, Minnesota, Michigan, Virginia, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Ontario, and I'm sure a couple other states. But they'll come in. We'll start Wednesday. Uh, it's going to uh, be it's, it's going to be in Maine. It's going to be in Maine. Can you report? Uh, it's actually in Portland, Maine. Okay. We'll have we'll have classroom from three to five thirty, mm -hmm. and then from six thirty to ten o'clock at night. Thursday, we spend uh, Friday morning for three and a half hours in the pool. Friday afternoon for three and a half hours in the pool. We go to a river uh, for three hours Friday night and do night ops. Saturday morning, we're back in the pool for three and a half hours. So then so. We Let's break this down a little bit. So yeah. you do the, the first day you have the from you said six to ten, right? Six or or there three yeah. o'clock to ten o'clock at night. So what what are you doing at nine o'clock at night? Is that actually classes? Is it more of a dinner or no, it's it's classroom. We'll take okay. an hour break and we'll feed them. We'll have right. dinner, dinner catered in, but we'll do sure. go through classroom and instructional methodology and ropes and knots and such. Are you, are you doing things that need to be done at night? Is that what that's happening? Or is it just you're trying to get the most time as you can out of the We're, Thursday, we're just doing all classroom. Gotcha. Okay. So that, so that Friday, we can spend the time in the pool, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday so, in the river. So what are you doing in the pool? Uh, basically learning basic skills, spinal injury management. Uh, we'll be testing their uh, swimming capabilities, uh, okay. types and uses of PFDs, uh, swimming rescues. Uh, Eric, rescues explain, explain to folks what a, a PFD is. Uh, personal flotation device, there life jacket. Yeah. But for first responders, we use a special type of PFD. Okay. And it's a type five vest. It provides anywhere from 25 to 30 pounds buoyancy, but it also has a harness on it so that these firefighters can be tethered to the boat or tethered from shore. Uh, they can go out and do a swimming rescue. And once they grab the victim, because they're tethered, they can be pulled back into shore or back to a boat and such. But we'll do, uh, we'll do uh, night ops Friday night in the Presumpscot River in Westbrook, Maine. Okay. And then we'll... Uh, and, what, and what does that look like? Well, basically, we're operating under flashlights and chemical lights. Okay. Uh, performing uh, spinal injury and in moving water. Uh, we'll be doing uh, shore base rescues, again, moving water, so that unlike uh, in a pool where you have a victim floating in the water and you throw sure. a line to them... They're floating downstream, and you need to throw the line just right in terms of timing to get to them. We'll also be doing swimming rescues where the rescuer is tethered to shore, and as the victim's floating downstream, the rescuer from shore needs to time his entry into the water just right and swim upstream, basically grab the victim into a bear hug, and then they're tethered downstream and, and rescued from there. And hopefully nobody gets by us. So we'll do that Friday night. And then Saturday afternoon, we're going so, to so do use, a, a, use a real person. Do you use like a dummy? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll, we'll have. Uh, so do you well, use a little bite yourself? How, how does it? <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll, we'll have 18 people out there training, okay. of which nine people will be serving as rescuers from shore and nine people will be floating downstream one at a time. Gotcha. So, but we, uh, it, it's. Again, labor intensive. You should sure. have an upstream victim entering the water. You'd have a downstream rescue with a throw bag. You have a downstream safety person in in case that victim got away. Uh, so we've got all kinds of uh, redundancy built into this in terms of safeguards. We've never had a uh, significant injury during a class, and hopefully that will continue. Knock, uh, knock on 
every wood you can. Yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> and then Saturday afternoon, we're going to uh, be in the ocean venue. Okay. And uh, actually, after the pool session Saturday morning, they'll come to Kenny Bunkport at that point. They're going to have lunch at a resort. And then we're going to inflate four boats and send them upstream in the river okay. out to the ocean. And then they'll have to land in the waves on the beach without capsizing. Wow. And then from the ocean, we'll have a, a series of rescues uh, in the surf conditions. And then we finish that day, that ocean session, by putting a – You mind describing that a little more? I mean, what that actually – Sure. I, and I want to get into it because it's super interesting, you know, and I'm a detailed person. So, you know, just to – I think it – it uh it doesn't do it justice just to say that you're doing, you know, ocean rescue training. Um, I think people can, you know, m maybe get the idea, but, but I know that, you know, to rescue someone in an ocean from a, you know, a float, uh, you know, a vessel that's, you know, floating that you've blown up essentially, um, you know, is, is a complicated um, and really, uh, what might say exciting endeavor, you know? Well, what, what, what they'll be doing in the ocean, basically prior to hitting the ocean environment, we will right. have, a river session will have three pool sessions mm -hmm. and they're basically going to take all the skills and principles that they learned in those venues and apply them to the ocean se session. Is, uh, se is that because the ocean is the most difficult of the three? Uh, no, not necessarily, but now we've got wave that we haven't had before and mm -hmm. you're trying to immobilize a victim while you've got wave action. So it's sure. critical that the rescuer who's taken C spine control as an example has his back to the waves so that he can be protecting the airway of the victim as the waves wash over him. Right. But one of the last evolutions we'll be doing at the ocean is we'll take a uh, mannequin, and we're going to throw him over the jetty, and the rescuers will be faced with uh, accessing the victim, immobilizing the victim, and then extricating the victim either up the rocks or onto a boat uh, in order to extricate the victim uh, and get him to EMS. So they'll be doing uh, scenario-based uh, sessions like that. Uh, one of the things that we do, one of the first things we do after we uh, land the boats is a jetty jump in which uh, it'll be high tide at that point. We, we plan the session around when high tide is going to be, but they'll actually be jumping from the top of the jetty into the ocean, trying to catch the wave as, as, as best they can. Uh, but it's always a very exciting situation, and many of the many of the students have never even seen the ocean before. Again, we've got people coming from Minnesota and Michigan right. and, and so forth, and uh, they've they've never seen the ocean. So uh, this will be interesting for them. A couple of years ago, we uh, had some people from South Carolina, and as we're driving up the coast in Kenny Bunkport to get to the beach, one guy looks to his left and says like holy cow and we're driving around a corner and next guy says except that's not what he said the next one repeats himself and i came around the corner and saw the waves and i said the same thing and they said you know it doesn't give us a lot of faith and confidence when the instructor says that too <laughs> but uh the bigger the waves the more exciting it's going to be the harder it's going to be for us to do our jobs but it's a training that no one will ever forget Absolutely. and then after, after that, we go back to the classroom and do some practice teaching in the classroom. And then Sunday morning, we're going to be at another river where they'll be doing some more scenario-based uh, situations. And then we finish up Sunday afternoon with classroom and graduation. And then I'm off on a plane to Atlanta, Georgia for my speaking engagement. So does everyone graduate? We hope so. Okay. Uh, these are all representatives from fire and rescue departments. The prerequisite is that they be in good physical condition, that they have some teaching experience, uh, that they be good swimmers. And uh, again, these are representatives from you know many different fire and rescue departments. So hopefully they've sent us the best. So I was going to ask, so it's not like the entire department gets trained. They send almost like a, a special forces Navy SEAL unit to you to get uh, trained specifically in this so that they have, you know, a handful of people. Right. They'll send us one to three people and okay. they're basically being trained as instructors so that now they can return and train their own personnel and the Got curriculum it. and okay. so forth. So, but it's, uh, it's labor intensive. We've got a, I've got a faculty of uh, two other instructors, one from Rhode Island, one from New Hampshire, that'll be assisting. And uh, again, we go from basically eight o'clock every morning until 10 o'clock at night. 
and for four days. So it's a it's a tough uh, situation, but it's a great training experience. Yeah, and it sounds like Maine might be the perfect spot to do it. You know, you've got the ocean, the the, the rivers there. Um, that might be hard to recreate anywhere else. Exactly, and when we do ice rescue, it's basically the same schedule. We do a we do a classroom all Thursday. We do ice in the morning, ice Friday afternoon, ice Friday night, night ops. Uh, the exact same schedule, except so, we're totally so, on and through the ice. So when do you do uh, the ice training? Uh, but, uh, we do a ice rescue train trainer academy every February, four days. Okay. And then we also do ice rescue technician courses uh, January, February, and March. So I want to get to the ice um, training in a second because that's super fascinating. But before we do, um, the, the regular the, the training you're doing this Thursday, when it applies to regular people, you know, if you had to give, you know, the people watching who probably aren't uh, firefighters and, and EMS, they could be, uh, but chances are they're, they're, they're moms and, and dads and, and regular folks. Um, you know, what advice would you give somebody who is, you know, who sees someone drowning and they need to get, get them out? You know, I, I would say go, you know, uh, you know, we'll say in a pool first and then a river and an ocean, you know, what, what would you do? Well, it doesn't matter what the venue it is. Okay. Uh, we want them, number one, uh, to be safe. Mm -hmm. If there's one victim, we don't want it to uh, expand to two or multiple victims. Sure. So we want them to, number one, call 911 with the expectation that hopefully the fire and rescue personnel and police officers that are responding are trained and equipped. And secondly, while they're waiting for rescue to arrive, they can perform a attempt to perform a shore-based or boat-based rescue. And by that, we mean that they can extend the reach, throw something to the victim, extend something to the victim, but don't go in the water unless they're trained and equipped to do so. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and that applies, obviously, to all, um, all kinds. So Correct. And it, water as far as ice, you know, as far as ice, what we advocate is that people need to our, our philosophy is that no ice should ever be considered a safe ice. And with that in mind, if you're going out onto the ice, you should carry a peeless plastic whistle to alert people if there's an emergency. So, so carry, what, what, what do you mean by a peeless? What does that mean? Uh, there are some whistles that are metal. If you okay. put a metal whistle in your mouth during the winter yeah, time, it may, well. it, it may be there until spring. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but by peeless, we mean that some whistles have a, a P inside, a cork P that needs okay. to vibrate to produce a sound. If that P gets wet, it no longer produces a sound. So there are P-less whistles that are made that don't uh, depend on a ball to, to rotate in, in, in the whistle to generate a sound. So okay. we recommend a P-less plastic whistle. We also recommend that people wear a float coat if they're going to be out in the ice and to carry ice picks. Uh, so that if they fall through the ice, they can pick their way back out onto the solid ice and then get themselves to safety. But regardless of what the situation is, whether it's water or ice, we recommend that call 911, only attempt a shore-based rescue. And as far as ice, we recommend you keep your dogs and uh, pets off the ice because about 75% of the incidents every year are triggered as a result of an animal going through the ice and wow. humans now going out trying to save them. Right. But it's typically the animals that survive and the humans do not. Oh, wow. Um, is the is that advice the same for, uh, at least for ice it's probably similar, but um, for regular water, mm -hmm. is the advice the same for children? If a, if a child falls into the water, uh, do you have the same advice? Uh, yes and no. Uh, okay. And I have the same advice in terms of being a first responder to keep yourself safe, only attempt a shore-based rescue. But the reality is, and that even goes for pets, it would be hard set to say that I'm not going to go after my dog or I'm not sure. going to go after my child. Right. But hopefully people are trained and equipped uh, to do so and do so safely. Uh, but the first responders need to be called so they can be on their way and respond. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're concerned about, and we teach this in both our water rescue and ice rescue training programs, is how to escape from a submerged vehicle. And for the first responders, how to penetrate a submerged vehicle in order to effect a rescue. Okay. Um, and and uh, 
uh, right now, for those that aren't aware of it, most of the vehicles being made today, uh, as of this past two years, the side windows and the doors are now being made of laminated glass instead of tempered glass. Okay. In the past, we used to state that if you go off the road, uh, you need to disengage your seatbelt. You need to open your window. And if your window doesn't open, we recommended that you shatter the window using a pick or a hammer or whatever the case may right. be. And I've, and I've seen like those pocket knives that have like a pointed end at the bottom so you can smack the Right. Like smack the window and hopefully break it. Yeah. But but the problem is those devices only work on tempered glass. Okay. And the new vehicles are again for the most part now being made with laminated glass instead. So you cannot shatter these windows any longer. Oh wow. So if your battery shorts out and you can't open the window, you basically uh, cannot well. escape. Okay. So that's uh, the federal government is in their infinite wisdom has stated that to the car manufacturers. We want you to develop a system that's going to prevent people from being ejected in a collision. So now, the, now, now did they do this because it was safer? Uh, okay, so they did it for collisions. It, in order to prevent ejections. However, right. if people are wearing seat belts and shoulder harnesses and now we have airbags, there are very, very few people that are being ejected. But the law went into effect 15 years ago that by this state, you're going to right. have to come up with this anti-ejection uh, system. Glass, and the, yeah. the, the easiest way to do that is to replace the tempered glass with laminated glass. So that's what's happening now. And again, if you can't open your window, you, you're stuck. So, uh, and, and I wonder, to, and I don't know the stats on this, obviously, the physiology, but I, I wonder which is worse, you know, ejecting through a windshield or you know, flying with such force that you would have been ejected and smashing up against the laminated glass. You know, part of me thinks it might be better for the person to just go through the window. Right, but if you're wearing seat belts and shoulder harnesses and yeah, so forth, not, and you've got airbags, yeah. e ejections aren't aren't you know that as, critical as, as common as they were 15 years ago. Right, right, right. Now at the same time, we're dealing with 1,500 submerged vehicle incidents every year. Wow, that, I didn't realize that many. And the death rate is four to six hundred people. Now that we have laminated glass instead of tempered glass in the new cars, the number, the frequency of incidents aren't going to decrease. They'll, they'll probably remain the same, but the uh, the deaths are most likely going to increase because occupants aren't going to be able to get out of the vehicles, and fire and rescue personnel arriving at the scene are going to have a much more difficult time getting into the vehicle. Because, because there's, there's, no, yeah, there's nobody to break the window. You can't open the door, right? It's impossible. The water pressure, the, right? The water pressure against the right. door makes it almost impossible to open, as well as the fact that you may have structural damage to the vehicle from going down the embankment into the water. So you may not be able to open the, the doors. As far as the windows, firefighters used to carry spring-loaded window punches. They no longer work. So the only way you can penetrate a side window or a front window these days is to use a saw. Uh, a lot of the saws are battery po powered. Sure. They don't work in the water. And they so take a long you, time. You know. Right. So you need to use a manual saw to cut the glass. Oh, no. And it's, it's, it's going to take time to do so. So the federal government needs to be looking at highways, especially down in Florida, where you've got, you know, so many bodies of water along the road. But we need to put up appropriate barriers to prevent vehicles from going off the road and into the water. I, I am a fan of water safety barriers in general, so that's that's always a good idea. Yeah. Um, you know, whether they're around a pool or uh, on the side of the road. Um, so I, you know, because most people watching this are looking for for child safety advice. Um, you know, what are some things that you tell people? Um, you know, they're specific to you know what you do. Uh, as it pertains to child safety and you know, and water safety, you know, children around the water. One of the things that we do is uh, we, when we train firefighters and police, whether it be at the technician level or as an instructor, we encourage them that they need to go back to their communities. And we're not just concerned about the training of the first responders. We need to educate the public about water safety. Right. Um, uh, as an example, we know that there's a major there's a, a great frequency of bathtub drownings. 
Right. So we want to educate the firefighters and police officers about the fact that we need to educate the people about the need for barriers around pools, the need for layers of protection in order to prevent unauthorized access into the water. We need to educate parents about never leaving children unattended in bathtubs. Uh, in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics advocates that only a mature four-year-old or even better, a six-year-old should not be left unattended in a bathtub. Um, and most of the public doesn't know that. So we're trying to educate the police and firefighters and EMS to not only train their own personnel, but to educate the public about general water safety practices. Uh, one of the things that I do as an expert, forensics expert in drowning aquatic injury cases, I look at every incident in terms of what could have been done to prevent the incident, how quickly the incident or its potential was recognized, and how effectively the incident or its potential was managed. And I, uh, unfortunately, I have so many cases where, because the layers of protection weren't there, a child was able to get an unauthorized access into the water. And that means uh, pool safety fences, it means supervision, it means doors and windows that are locked and, and out of reach of young children, uh, it means pool alarms and, and such. But we need to be sure that the layers of protection are adequate in order to prevent uh, children from getting to the pool during a lapse or lack in adult supervision. Um, and especially because we all know, you know, adult supervision can and does fail. Uh, right. You know, so and, the majority of drownings happen when a parent was supposed to be supervising. You know, we're all human. People have multiple children. You know, it's it's a tough thing to watch a, a very mobile uh, toddler 24 hours a day. And you and I happen to know an individual who recently uh, lost a, a child and has another one that's significantly injured as a result. Sure. But this was a case where uh, two kids were, they got up in the morning, the mother gave them their bottles, and she put them back into their crib like she always does. Uh, she fell asleep. Parents do that. And these kids who had never climbed out of their crib before were able to get out of the crib. They were able to get out into the pool area because the door wasn't latched properly. And it wasn't their fault. It was because of a problem in the door. And they were able to access the water and one child drowned. The other one was severely injured. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and he probably has, um, I would say he does have, you know, permanent lifelong, um, you know, mental and, and physical disabilities. Right. You know, as a result of that, you know, and, and this was a lapse in adult supervision and every parent has experienced what I call a where's Johnny episode. Right. The child is with you and all of a sudden you turn around and the child is gone. And that's why these layers of protection need to be there so that in the event of a lapse in adult supervision, the child can't get access into the water. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've told this story, you know, probably, you know, three times in the last couple of days, but, you know, every parent has a story. Uh, that's funny in hindsight about their child, you know, covering themselves in peanut butter or drawing all over a wall. And, you know, I always use that example as uh, one that if, you know, they had chosen to get to the pool and you didn't have some kind of pool fence, uh, they would have ended up in the pool. You know, exactly. thankfully they just decided to go for the peanut butter, but uh, you know, that you just got lucky in that scenario. Right. And uh, unfortunately I have had, in excess of 350 cases that I've consulted on. And, you know, the majority of these are young children and the majority of these have occurred during a, a lapse in adult supervision. And it's because the layers of protection weren't there or the child was able to breach a fence or a gate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we need to be sure that there are child safety fences and gates and uh, latches on windows and doors that are self-closing and self-latching and such. So I wanted to mention, um, I'm not sure if she's still watching, but uh, Marie Blizzard, um, are you, are you, you know her? No. Marie Blizzard, well, she, she knows you. Okay. She says that your, uh, Jerry is very dedicated to his work and she has learned a lot from you. So, go her. Okay. That's fantastic. Um, so um, the, the training you offer, um, what are some avenues that, you know, public and safety, you know, the public safety and rescue agencies can get the, the sort of training you've talked about? Uh, the uh, American Red Cross offers uh, training programs. The YMCA does. Uh, the National Drowning Prevention Alliance uh, has a great deal of information on their website. But there's a lot of information that's available through the Consumer Product Safety Commission. 
And if you go to cpsc.gov and put it uh, in the search for swimming pools, there's all kinds of information that's available. Mm -hmm. But we also ask for the pediatricians to be involved as well. Um, and, and that means that if a pediatrician is meeting with a family and the family says we have a pool, you ask, you know, is there a child safety fence and gate around the pool? Are the windows and doors latched and locked appropriately? Uh, are, are there window alarms and pool alarms and so forth that are, are in place? So the pediat pediatricians can help a lot in, in, in this case. Sure. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, there are other avenues as well, uh, child uh, birth classes and so forth. Swimming and water safety should definitely be a part of that. Uh, so that we can prevent these tragic incidents from occurring in the first place. So you mentioned you do a lot of uh, consultation work too on on drowning cases, legal and otherwise, right? Right. So so tell me some, something about that work. Well, I, I've got a case right now as an example in California, and I can't go into too many details, but this was a case where a, a school outing, a tragic incident in which a 13-year-old uh, got into water over his head, struggles at the surface of the water for 20 seconds and submerges. There are lifeguards present. Uh, in fact, there are like nine lifeguards present. The child is underwater for two minutes and nobody observes him. Finally, he's brought to the surface and there's a very good, there's a very good chance that this child could have been successfully resuscitated had the guards acted appropriately. However, for the next seven minutes, this child was floated around in the water uh, with a backboard thinking that this was a diving accident. Uh, no one checked his breathing, no one checked his cardiac stat. So he's finally brought out of the water after nine minutes without breathing and without pulse. And it's a, a very tragic incident. And again, had the lifeguards been appropriately positioned, appropriately trained, had appropriate supervision gone on with the supervisors, uh, this incident should have been recognized at its onset before the submersion even occurred, or once the submersion did occur, intervention, appropriate intervention, to get the child out of the water and begin uh, effective resuscitation efforts, and we'd have an entirely different outcome today. That's, I mean, to, to think that, you know, literally education would have made the difference between someone, you know, being okay or not okay is... You know, it's frustrating and it's heartbreaking and, you know, it's it's sad. And this was a situation where the child was in the middle of the pool. Uh, there's no way this could have been even considered to be a diving accident. Right. Uh, yet it was treated as that and no one assesses his breathing the cardiac rhythm. So it's it just, just a tragic incident. And I've got, you know, so many similar cases like that. I, I had a case, another case in California where, uh, and it's in fact, it's on our website at lifesaving.com. But a four year old was at camp for the first day. Uh, we have a video of the counselor throwing the child up and catching him in his arms 12 times. And then on the 12th time, the counselor lets the kid go. The kid's 48 inches tall. He's uh, let go in four and a half feet of water. And with two lifeguards present and the child struggling in the water and then floats at the surface of the water for eight minutes and nobody sees him, not the two counselors, no, I'm sorry, not the four counselors that were there and not the two lifeguards, uh, nobody saw this kid and he's floating in the water for eight minutes undetected by anyone. Wow. And had the lifeguards been strategically positioned and vigilant in their duties, the distress should have been recognized within 20 seconds. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's, that's each one amazing. of my cases. Each one of my cases is more tragic than the next. So, what is it you look for in a case? Uh, as I mentioned, I, in simplistic terms, I look at what could have been done, what should have been done to prevent the incident. That means that there should have been barriers, there should have been vigilant and strategically positioned lifeguards who are qualified, not just certified, and that these lifeguards were scanning in a in a uh, appropriate and effective method and so forth. So, so I mean, it, if uh, if a lifeguard watches this, what is something, you know, if you had a piece of advice that you could give them, to, I mean, I'm sure it's a whole curriculum, but if you could tell them one thing, you know, what, what would it be? Or one or two things maybe? Well, unfortunately, lifeguards being trained today and they're taught CPR and they're taught that CPR saves lives. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, CPR doesn't save lives. No, not drowning saves lives. You know, that's a, the, the, only, yeah. the only thing CPR does is sustains the victim in this gray area between clinical and biological death until we can intervene with advanced life support, get them to a hospital and so forth. So CPR doesn't save lives. That being said, lifeguards need to be realized that you don't have any second chances. Your job is to prevent this incident from occurring. If you can't prevent it, as soon as the incident occurs, you need to be vigilant and strategically positioned so you can recognize it at its onset and then intervene appropriately and deal with the incident before we have a deterioration into cardiac arrest. And we know that a drowning victim typically will struggle the surface of the water for 20 to 60 seconds. So, During that so let's talk about that real quick because you know, um, I know from doing this for a long time, the drowning doesn't look like drowning. You know, Mario Vitone uh, put out that famous um, article that right. has been spread throughout the, the world now. But unfortunately, most people still don't know that drowning doesn't look like what we see on television. That right. it's not people thrashing about, it's not arms there, there's no yelling. Um, so uh, just real quick, do you want to uh, explain to people what to look for in a drowning victim? What does somebody look like when they're drowning? Well, basically, the first indication is that the victim typically will go vertical, mm -hmm. that they may have started in a horizontal position, but now they go vertical. Their legs are are ineffective and they're kicking, and all the action basically is in their arms, and the arms are typically going out laterally. So the first thing to look for is somebody going from a horizontal to a vertical position in the water. Uh, they look like they're playing in the water, when in reality, they're engaged in a life and death struggle and they're only able to sustain themselves for 20 to 60 seconds. They can't call out for help uh, because their priorities get air in, not verbalize anything out. And, and that's, a, that, that's not a decision. They're physiological, un, physiologically unable to call out for help. Th their body won't let them yell out. That's correct. And at yeah. the same time, during the struggling process, they may be aspirating water into their airway, which triggers what's referred to as a laryngeal spasm. And it's a reflex spasm of the airway that shuts down and prevents water from going to the lungs, but it also prevents air from going into the lungs. And that's why they can only struggle for 20 to 60 seconds before they're rendered unconscious. Their heart continues beating, however, for up to several minutes. So going to my case in California, the fact that this child's distress was recognized after being on the bottom for two minutes, there's a good chance he still had cardiac rhythm when we were brought right. to the surface. If he didn't, um, had he been brought out of the water immediately and provided positive pressure ventilation and chest compression DPR and had an AED available, chances are we would have had a good outcome. But because of the fact he was floated around in the water for seven minutes while his cardiac rhythm is deteriorating to nothing, uh, by the time EMS got there, uh, it, it was basically too late. So, so you look for somebody that turns vertical, um, that their, their arms extend laterally. Um, I've I've heard they do a, like a doggy paddling motion with, with that background. You know, that, that's you know, correct. And yeah. So the action they're doing is not making any forward progress. So the first thing is going from horizontal to vertical. Second thing is not making any forward progress, and they're moving. Don't look and expect them to be yelling and calling for help. But the other thing, too, is some victims simply go unconscious uh, as a result of the fact that they were struggling and somebody else thought it was play. Right. But I've had numerous cases where victims have either been floating at the surface of the water or on the bottom of the pool or whatever. And even lifeguards have seen them and not recognize the fact that this is a, an emergency situation. I, I had a, a case at a very prestigious prep school where the lifeguard saw the victim lying on the bottom of the pool with his arms outstretched like this, and she assumed he was timing himself. Oh, and she no. allowed him to lie on the bottom of the pool for as much as 20 minutes before anybody recognized we have an emergency. Wow. For 20 minutes? 20 minutes. So, like I said, <laughs> e each one of these cases is I mean, just more tragic than the next. I mean, that's, this, that's, that's my this, yeah. this was a case where the lifeguard was not appropriately trained. If the lifeguard was not strategically positioned, the lifeguard was not qualified, may have been certified, 
but wasn't qualified to, to work at this facility, recognize the hazards, identify the risks, and intervene appropriately. Have you ever had a drowning incident? Have you ever almost drowned? Uh, I have. Yeah? I have. I have. Uh, uh, I was in a kayak once, and I capsized in the kayak and wasn't able to self-extricate myself as quickly as I would have liked. Right. Uh, I've had how, a, how, uh, how old were you? Uh, I was probably 16 or so. Okay. Um, I, one of the things that I used to do when I was with the Red Cross in Houston is we used to uh, do a river rescue excursion. We used to bring uh, rescue personnel to the Guadalupe River and basically set up rescue stations on Memorial Day weekend, July 4th weekend, and Labor Day weekend. And we used to pull hundreds of people out of the water uh, that were in distress. Uh, not to say they would have drowned had we not been there, but we know there certainly would have been drownings had we not been there. Sure. But one uh, weekend we had some bad weather, so we thought we would put ourselves in the same predicament that we were pulling people out from. Mm -hmm. And one of them was what you call a low head dam. And when water runs from one elevation to the next, it creates a backflow. So I decided that we would rig some lines and we put ourselves in that situation to experience what it was we were pulling people from. And uh, I put myself in and I was getting recirculated. I got sucked down and spit out and dragged back to the face of the dam and sucked down and spit out and dragged back. And each time I tapped my head, on, you know, saying I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And about the fourth or fifth time that I so, got sucked down. So, so is, that the, uh, is that the safe signal? You tap your head so people know you're okay? Tap your head. And okay. people, on, people on shore would do the same thing. They'd ask you, are you okay? And if you right. do that back. But anyway, the fourth or fifth time I got sucked down, I got snagged on something underneath. And had I not had a knife with me to cut myself free, I'd probably still be there. Right. They would have assumed you're still okay, like you were the other four times. Yep. yep. And that, that would have been it. Wow. So right. good thing you, had knife, so you literally cut yourself free? I cut myself free. And that's why we advocate that uh, rescue personnel always carry a knife on them. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, we recommend two knives. One knife attached to your life jacket and one knife attached to the opposite side of your body down by your ankle so that if you can't get to one, you can get to another. Sure. So, uh, but, you know, and that's the other thing. We talk about the fact that fire and rescue personnel not only need to be trained, but they need to be adequately equipped as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you um, hadn't had that knife, you would have been stuck. You know? I, I had a situation in, uh, a, as an expert, had a drowning case in West Virginia, Mm -hmm. where a uh, guided raft trip, the, one of the rafts capsized and threw out six people in the water. And they had downstream safety and they had rescue lines set up and so forth. So they had multiple people hanging onto the line. And somebody yelled from shore, uh, let go of the line, uh, meaning that there's more downstream safety, let go of the line and they'll catch you downstream. What happened is the rescuer on shore let go of his line. Oh, no. And the line ended up wrapping itself around the legs of a female victim. The guide didn't have a knife, which he should have. So as a result, he swam out there. He couldn't untangle her. He had to swim back to shore, ruffle through rup sacks and try no to way. find a knife. Finally found a knife, swam out there and cut her free. And she wow. drowned as a result of that incident. And again, that's why people need to be appropriately equipped, not just with their life jackets, but with knives and right. whatever else may be necessary to intervene appropriately. Jeez. That's, so so how, how many of these cases have you had? I've had uh, in excess of 350 cases to date. Uh, we currently have about 30 ongoing cases going on. In fact, in the past month, I've been down to Houston for a drowning investigation. West Palm Beach for a drowning investigation, Orlando for, Orlando for a drowning investigation. I had a trial in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I've got another trial coming up uh, next month in Miami. I've got a uh, drowning investigation, a diving accident investigation in, to do in Key Largo in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we're we're pretty busy. Well, next time you're in South Florida, let me know. You can come by and, uh, and see how we make Mesh pool safety fencing. It's a well, safety I'm, fencing. I'm trying to figure out how the chair in the background moves every once in a while. Oh, oh, you know what that is? That's my trash can. 
I, I have a, a voice activated trash can. Okay. And, uh, it it, um, it airs on the side of assuming you want it to open than not opening. So uh, Got it. that's what that, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's opening. That's hysterical. <laughs> I didn't realize that was happening. Um, so do you, do you normally work for the plaintiff or the defendant? Uh, it's about 90% for the plaintiff, uh, okay. 10% for the de defense. Uh, interesting enough, I, uh, uh, I've got two active cases going on, three active cases going on right now for the defense. Uh, okay. And one, now, I mean, you've got all these cases going on, you're doing the training. Um, are you by yourself? I mean, you have employees? Um, uh, I've got instructors that assist me in my okay. training. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also trained 350 instructors around the country in Canada, so they're doing training as well. And sure. Our job is just to develop the curriculums and support them in their efforts. Right. But uh, as far as the uh, my work as a consultant, as a forensic expert, that's uh, myself. I've got some people that assist me sure. in preparing my work, but uh, pretty much just me. But but the scheduling, the, the booking the work, the you know, administrative stuff, that's all you. Right. That's impressive. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I am not good at that, so I... I, I, I uh, I am you. So uh, you said about 90% um, plaintiff, 10% defendant? Right. I just recently had a... Uh, you have a preference? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I, won't, I will only take a case for the defense if it's a righteous case. Okay. Uh, for instance, I've had... Uh, and I will only take a plaintiff's case if it's a righteous case. Right. A classic example is... Um, how do you define uh, a righteous case? Well, I, I had one case that resulted in a hundred thirty million dollar jury verdict. Okay. Uh, as a result of that case, I've had I had lawyers coming out of the woodwork who wanted to hire me as the expert for their case. Uh, one lawyer contacts me and said, uh, "I represent a family of a ten year old who drowned in a public swimming pool." Okay. So I started asking questions. What time did this occur? Ten o'clock at night. I said, well, okay. Uh, so I'm figuring maybe the, the fence was breached and it wasn't intact. I said, uh, any problem with the fence? Yeah. I said, well, how tall was the fence? He said, 10 feet. And okay. fences only need to be five feet. Right. And I said, and he said, and there wasn't any rescue equipment out there. I said, it occurred at 10 o'clock at night. Right. Why would there be rescue equipment? Or anybody. Then, yeah. or, or anybody. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, how did this kid get over the fence? And, and finally he said, what did you expect him to do? Put razor barb over the fence? And he said, well, there was razor barb over the fence, except for the small section where this kid was able to climb the fence and get over a 10-foot fence. So, you know, that's the kind of case that I will not take. Right, right, right. Uh, I've, wow. also had, I've also had cases where... Uh, uh, the the plaintiff would said, well, the lifeguard failed to uh, identify the victim on the bottom of the, the lake and recognize his drowning, only to find out that there was no struggle at the surface of the water and that by the time the lifeguards were notified of the incident was 45 minutes later. So, uh, again, that's, to me, not a righteous case. And if right. there's no struggle, you can't expect the lifeguards to recognize the fact that somebody has submerged you need a credible witness to tell the lifeguards immediately and give them an idea uh, what part of the water this person went down. So, like I said, I, I scrutinize the cases that I take and will only take a case that I believe in. Now, that being said, I recently had a murder case uh, in which I defended the defendant as the expert, and uh, this involved a... Uh, woman that was charged with shaken baby syndrome oh wow only to find out that um the child upon autopsy there was indications of water in water inhalation okay and i talked to the jury about the incidence of bathtub drownings and uh, she was acquitted uh, due to reasonable doubt and uh, and again it was all because there was water inhalation the child had been in a tub, and we believe that the child's airway became compromised while he was in the tub and went downhill from there. So she was charged with murder of the baby that she just lost. Correct. Which, I mean, bad Correct. enough that she already, you know, lost her baby. Uh, but then to be, you know, wow, that's, uh, that's tragic. I'm glad that it had the, hopefully, the right outcome, you know. 
uh, and we hope it was the right outcome. And, right. You know, it's up to a jury to decide. But here was a a, a case where, uh, because of the water inhalation, it gave us the indication that this could have been a a drowning incident. And uh, again, she she stated the child had been in the bathtub prior to the child developing uh, airway distress. And so, I mean, that sounds kind of like an outlier. But are there are there common themes that you ex you know see throughout your cases? Uh, most of the residential backyard pool drownings are because of inadequate barriers. Okay. Most of the hotel and resort drownings are because so. I mean. And, and obviously this is a little bit biased on my part, but you would recommend then that obviously um, people should have some kind of barrier around their pool. Absolutely. The yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, if the home serves as uh, ha has an exit, a door, a window out to the pool area, which almost that, all of them do. Yeah. Which all, all of them do. Then that pool should have a fence around the, an isolation fence to prevent a child who can get out into the yard from getting into the pool. Right. Our hotel, motel, resort drownings are typically because of the lack of supervision provided by the management and also by inadequate barriers. And our open water incidents are typically due to, uh, well, we have a saying in the police and fire service that what keeps us in business is mother nature and stupidity. And there's a, a, a lot of stupidity that goes on uh, people that are uh, inebriated, that are behind the wheel of a boat or going out and diving into shallow water and things like that. So uh, uh, basically, people need to use some common sense. People need to to safeguard themselves in a lot of ways. But as far as uh, um, the open water areas, uh, any time a child has access to the water, they need to be vigilantly, uh, actively supervised. You know, I've heard before that when it comes to open water um, situations, that the accident actually actually happens before they get on the water. You know, most of the time when there's an open water scenario, the mistake was made on shore. You know, by not preparing properly, by not bringing you know life jackets, by not having making sure the vessel is uh, properly maintained. That op it, most of the time in open water scenarios, it wasn't a mistake made on the water. It was something made before they even got on the boat. You know. Correct. And right now we're dealing with, uh, this is now May, 8, May 9th. Yeah, May 9th. Yeah. Uh, our water temperature here is probably 45 degrees here wow. in Kennebunkport, Maine. That sounds terrible. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, it might be 100 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. People are going to be out on the boats or out on the jetty and say, you know, I'm going to jump in and cool off. Well, they're going to jump into 50 degree water and they're going to experience what we refer to as a torso reflex. It's a gasp reflex. And if they jump in the water and the cold water hits their chest and the face and they gasp and the face is in the water at the time they do that, they aspirate this cold water into their airway and, and drown as a result. So we need to educate the public about number one, always wear a life jacket when you're operating in and around cold water. And secondly, in order to prevent torso reflex, you need to jump in and cover your mouth and nose at the same time so that when you do gasp, you're not aspirating the water. And, and everyone's experienced this torso reflex. You know, if you've ever gone into a, any cold body of water, the first thing you do is you go, <gasps> you know, because you're so shocked by how cold it is, you know. Exactly. But um, and, and so just, 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 you know, as we speak, we just got a call for an emergency medical incident. Okay. So I don't need to go just yet, but All right. we're waiting here. That's uh, oh, interesting stuff. So, so we're talking about cold water, and then we'll wrap this up real quick, um, just in case something happens. Um, so we talked a little bit about your ice training, but we didn't get too far into it. You, you want to go over that a little bit, and then we can, we can call it? Well, what we do with the ice rescue training is we, our curriculum basically is we give them a two-and-a-half-hour classroom session, and then we put them out on and through the ice for two-and-a-half hours bring them back for lunch and put them out on and through the ice for another two and a half hours. I, I, I hate, I hate cold weather. This sounds like well, a nightmare to me. Yeah. Well, the, the suits that they wear <laughs> right. are designed to keep them warm, afloat and dry. Okay. And, uh, uh, while they're wearing these suits they they actually can't overdress. We advocate that they just wear a long sleeve poly shirt, perhaps a fleece vest, mm -hmm. uh, 
and that's it in shorts basically underneath otherwise okay. they, they get too hot but these suits provide about 30 32 pounds buoyancy and it keeps them warm and dry mm -hmm. and at the same time they're tethered at all times and we'll put a victim in the water and uh, their job basically is to uh, give them about 20, 20 different evolutions starting with no equipment at all and then using basic elementary equipment such as a, a sling or a buoyant sling or a ring buoy or a ladder or a backboard and we advance throughout the day more advanced more technical skills and then the afternoon session we use basically specialized equipment that's designed specifically for ice rescue but our philosophy is that when we teach the course we provide the education that they can uh, every conceivable piece of equipment that might be on an ambulance or in a police car or on a fire truck showing how that equipment can be used if you don't have the specialized equipment. But they, they uh, during the evolutions, they they work as a victim, they work as a primary rescuer, they work as a secondary rescuer, or they're a line tender. And they go through all five positions, and then they move on to the next evolution. So by the end of the day, again, they will have completed about 20, 21 skill evolutions on and through the ice. And it's a very exciting training that they do. And, and a lot of experience what it's like to be a victim, right, to be rescued. Which Correct. Which is now, really inv invaluable, actually. Right. And we, we take the philosophy in, when we're doing the rescues that all our victims are passive. And the reason being is that if a firefighter responds to a, an incident where somebody's through the ice, if the victim has been in the water for 10 minutes or so, they no longer have the dexterity in their hands and their arms to assist in their own rescue. So for that reason, we teach them that every single skill we do, the victim cannot assist in his own rescue, and the rescuer needs to perform the rescue himself. So I, I've read about um, you know what to do in the event of a uh, falling into this before, and I know that you have a very short window of time um, that you can act in before hypothermia sets in, before your your body shuts down, and right. there's a few uh, things you should do immediately as soon as you fall in, in the water. So you know if you know if you were walking on the ice and God forbid and you didn't have you know the ice picks on you, uh, God forbid, um, and you fell into the water, you know what should someone do? Well, the very first thing is don't panic and control your breathing. Uh, if you that cold water hits your fez, face, if you haven't experienced the torso reflex, chances are if you're holding onto the ice shelf, you're going to be hyperventilating. Mm -hmm. So, but that's eliminating carbon dioxide, and that's going to make you pass out even sooner. So, the first thing is to control your breathing, try to slow it down. But hold on to the ice shelf, get your body as horizontal as you can. Can I have the charger for this? and then swim onto the ice shelf. And once you're on ice, to roll away from the compromised ice so you can uh, basically get to your knees and, and then make your way back to shore. But where you need to be, basically, if you fell through one section of ice, don't try to get to the other section of ice. Uh, you were on safe ice, go back to the safe, same safe, you know, ice condition. But the important thing is, as soon as you hit the water, control your breathing, hold on to the ice shelf, you've got about 10 minutes where you can still have the dexterity you need to climb out. So kick your feet and try to swim onto the ice shelf and then roll away from the compromised ice. So there's a there's a technique, right, to climbing out of the ice. Uh, you know, so you want to get as much as your upper body on top of the, the ice as possible. I think you get only one or two shots at um you can only do it one or two times before you run out of energy and you're going to end up stuck on the side. Well, the, so it's it, you've so got I know you want you to get your body kind of horizontal, right? Is that right? Right. Get your body horizontal. Kick your feet. Try to swim onto the ice. If you so not yank, but swim. Right. And if you can get your elbows up there, again, use your elbows. And if you have ice picks, you can pick your way out as well. Right. That's why we encourage that everybody carries something like ice picks with you. Yeah, and, uh, and and like you said, you're, you're gonna you're gonna pass out within a few minutes. So it's uh, it's important that they get up on the side. So you know, if they don't make it on, uh, God forbid, um, you know, they they go unconscious. But better to go unconscious on the side of the ice than uh, under the water. So right, and yeah. and if you're stuck in the ice and you can't get out, this sounds a little perhaps barbaric, 
but we recommend removing your gloves, placing your hands on the ice so your skin will stick to the ice so that if you do go are rendered unconscious, you're still at the surface. Wow. Otherwise, if you're rendered unconscious and you can't hold on to the ice shelf. You might slide off. Exactly. But uh, so yeah, actually, so actually use your skin to adhere to the ice to keep you on. Correct. Wow. You know, it, what's, uh, I mean, what's so important about knowing this is no one is going to think of that on their own, right? No one is going to think to take their own gloves off on the fly. So, I mean, that's why you kind of have to have this in your head already, you know, when you go in these scenarios, because, you know, you're, you're not going to, you know, invent that, you right. know, while you're, while you're sitting there. So, uh, but again, the most important thing is because of the fact that we advocate that no ice should ever be considered the safe ice. Right, right. The prevention is the most carry, important part. Carry your whistle, carry your ice pick so that in right. the event this occurs, you can self rescue while you're waiting for it. EMS to arrive. Right. So uh, horizontal, swim on, climb, and then roll away, not walk, because you don't want to break more ice this year. Uh, as you're Correct. Off, right? Correct. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we, we've had a thing. Is there anything you want to leave people with? Any any comments or um, any questions you have for me? Um, uh, just the fact that we are approaching swim season. Sure. Uh, again, it's swim season all the time down in Florida, but in other right. parts of the country. Yeah, it's water uh, safety month right now, so that's in particular, right. you know. And in many parts of the country, you're dealing with cold water, so uh, you need to safeguard yourselves. And again, anytime, uh, life jackets aren't just for boats. Uh, if you're going to be operating, swimming, playing around the water, we recommend wearing life jackets for weekend non swimmers all the time. But when you're dealing with cold water, you need to have life jackets as well. That, protect yourselves that, that's great advice and uh i think the info that you've imparted has been really really useful so i, I really appreciate it and, and thank great. you for the time you know, you've been super generous with your time and hopefully you don't get called out onto a, a rescue right now unless you want to of course but uh, hopefully it uh, it goes on without you and great. uh i really appreciate it jerry and if next time you're in florida you know let me know I'm, sure I'm will. happy to have you come by and um uh, if you or anybody else wants to see tomorrow um, we're having on Alyssa. Alyssa is a a water safety advocate, water safety expert. Um, she helps run a, a nonprofit that was started after after a child drowned, and she's another awesome human being. So we'll be we'll be talking to her tomorrow at eleven thirty Eastern time. So uh, just just tell you one quick story. Is, yeah, please. Uh, just last week, I was flying down to West Palm Beach for a drowning mm -hmm. investigation, and I connected in I think Laguardia, okay. and I'm I'm way down there. I'm sitting next to a gentleman, and uh, he asked me what I did, and I said, well, you know, going down for a drowning investigation, and he said, uh, my grandson drowned. Oh, wow. And it turns out I was the expert in his grandson's drowning case. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, his the family also started a drowning prevention foundation as a result of that incident. So there's some good that came out of it, but just the coincidence of sitting on the plane talking to this individual who was the grandfather of this child whose family I represented. Are you allowed to share the name of the foundation? Uh, actually, actually, I can. It's the Zach Foundation. Oh, I'm I'm very familiar with them. They're, they're, yeah, right. Yeah. No, we we worked with them with the NDPA, and uh, I've met them. They're they're nice people. So, yeah. Very good. Well, thanks, Jerry. I, I really, really appreciate this. This has been Anytime, fantastic. Eric. And maybe we can do it again in the winter when we get into more uh, ice and, and winter safety again. Sounds great. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Take care. Take care. Yep. All right. Let me figure out how to end this here. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Boop, boop, boop. Click. Oh, I got it. Click on live broadcast for me.